have my coffee and away we go. All right, so here we are. Uh, let's take a look at Genesis 33. Yeah, Exodus is a better book. Not a better book, it's just where I am. So uh, better for us to be on the same page, so to speak. Uh, and let's pray as we go into it. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together once again as we go into your word. Please open up our hearts and minds to hear your voice as you speak to us, as you reveal to us, as you lead us and guide us in your ways. Like Moses, we pray that you show us your ways. And uh, so as we go into your word, may you be glorified in what we read and learn or even reminded of. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So let's just do a little bit of uh, review. This is chapter 33, verse 12. Um, Israel has, uh, if you remember, created the, um, the bronze calves while Moses was waiting on the Lord. <clears throat> and they um, quickly reverted back to that worship. But in verse 13, let's go back to verse 12, actually, of chapter 33. This is kind of where we left off last week. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. <clears throat> the Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. <clears throat> then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place <coughs> pardon me, near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back. But my face must not be seen. That's where we left off last week. And the question was, I thought God saw... Um, I thought Moses saw God face to face. My take on that is, um, and it's, it's something that we uh, talked about last week, the Godhead. It's not, it's not as commonly talked about as, as it used to be, but, um, the Godhead meaning that when, when you go through the Old Testament, God reveals himself in very magnificent, powerful ways that we just read and we are reading. He comes down on the mountain, and he, but that's not the only way that God reveals himself. He, he takes on human form. And you see this happen 
number of times in the Old Testament. Um, one of those times when he goes to Abraham and is revealing to Abraham what he's going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not just him. There's two angels too. And they eat and they have a meal. I mean, it's very clear this is not spiritual beings that are just floating around. And Abraham recognizes him. Not afraid of him. And they have this discussion, and then the angels themselves go on. If you remember the account, the angels physically take Lot and pull him out. It was a very physical thing. These are angelic beings that will take on human form. They don't, it's not their dwelling. They don't live there, but they can visit there from time to time. In the same way that human beings are, this is where we live right now. But we can be carried up into various heavenly realms. Paul writes about this in his letters. I know someone that went to the third heaven. So very, that's the highest one. But he doesn't stay there. In fact, Paul's not even sure if he went there physically or not because of the, the experience itself. And that's, that's one account in the Old Testament. Another account um, is, say, when Jacob wrestles with the angel. And then goes back and forth. Well, I, I saw God face to face. And so God appears um, routinely in the patriarchal period in physical form. It's not the only time. He's going to go on. Uh, when we get into Joshua and Joshua is getting ready to go into the promised land, there's an angel with a drawn sword. And he's not freaked out. Who are you? You for us, for our enemies? Neither. But as the commander of the Lord's army, I'm standing before you. So, and, and <clears throat> the angel of the Lord that goes before Israel is not separate, but still one. My name is in him. He is mine. Don't, you know, there's this intentional blurring of the lines, even when you look at how the Lord revealed himself to Moses in the fire. Is God speaking? Is the angel speaking? Who? And, he, and, the, and the author goes back and forth. There's no clearly delineated form that God takes. This is not uncommon to Jewish thought. What does, what is rejected is God becoming man incarnate. That's, a, that's, that's too far for them. And so shortly after that, Jewish thought begins to retreat. And this, no, that's, that's too much. But up until then, the Godhead was not uncommon <coughs> uh, in terms of Jewish understanding of God. And you also get the dynamic where, yes, God is in the... the, the the third heaven, if you will, and he's here. So you won't, you get him where he's simultaneously in two places. That's not hard. I mean, it. that's not difficult then to understand that Jesus, God, can pray to his Father in heaven because it's already, it's already in play. It's already part of their mindset. So when, the reason why I'm saying this is when God appears to, to um, Moses, my take is that he certainly can't appear in his full glory. It'd be way too much for him. So he appears to Moses to the degree that Moses can interact with him and not be completely shut down by his glory. Face-to-face, -face, yes, but but in a manner that, that Moses can, can tolerate, if you will. Jesus is asked, if you remember, <coughs> show us the Father. Um, and I think it was um, John, in fact, just hold on to your spots there for a second. Let's go to, to the Gospel of John. I believe this is 14. Let me just make sure I get this right. Yeah, 14.
This is John chapter 14. Uh, John chapter 14, verse, uh, let's go with 8, yeah, or uh, 5. Let's go with 5, and then we'll just kind of lead into it. This is John chapter 14, verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. (coughs) Philip said, Lord, show us the father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. And so you have yet another interaction where, in this case, God doesn't take on human form. He becomes human, becomes incarnate. Okay? Let's take a look at chapter 34 of Exodus. Any questions on that? It's kind of a, it's something that runs through all of Scripture, but it's not, it's not talked about very often, you know, the Godhead. So we understand that God had Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and rightfully so. But the Godhead was being revealed already in the Old Testament. All right, chapter 34. The Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready in the morning, and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and the herds may graze in front of the mountain. So Moses chilled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning, (coughs) as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down, these are empty tablets. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. O Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, he said, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. Then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you. That you, by the way, is plural. Before all your people, I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Obey what I command you today. I will drive out before you the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you 
are going, or they will be a snare among you. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and cut down their Asherah poles. Do not worship any other god. Anyone want to take a guess? Is that Hebrew word for God? Elohim, you're right on. Do not worship any other Elohim. For the Lord, his name, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous Elohim. Be careful. You know, it. <laughs> when you think of jealousy, we kind of tend to think of our own human jealousy. It <laughs> but when you look at the dynamics that are revealed in Scripture, God gives birth, the Lord gives birth to his human family. It's my family. And you stole it. You took my children and you brought them into slavery. And then you, you, you through rebellion, brought them under a curse of death. Yeah, I'm jealous. It's not our jealousy. Our jealousy is petty. His jealousy is righteous. If I have, you know, have a father, you have children, and the nation is attacked, goes to war, and the invading nation takes my children into captivity and puts them into a, a work camp, I am jealous. They're not your children. It's not petty. It's righteous. And this is the dynamic that's playing out here. One of the things that's very... <coughs> I'm, I'm debating teaching on this a bit, a bit. But remember that what... As we're reading here, I'm going to drive these nations out. If you knew the gods that they worshipped, you would see the depravity of what they inflicted on the people. Every single deity required human sacrifice. Every one. It wasn't just this silly mythological thing that there, there were spiritual ramifications for what took place. And you know, I think I might do that because um, we don't know their gods anymore. So what do you think happened when, say, in a European culture, when those gods are removed, I'm talking now, say, the Roman Empire, when all those gods are removed from the temple and the spiritual entities that are behind those gods are removed out of sight, out of mind, you think they just went away? You wait for a proper time. And then you come back into the culture. And you're not going to take on the same form that you originally had. You'll take on a different form. They haven't gone away. You know, it's commonly thought that the devil is in, uh, is in hell. And it'd be nice if he was. But he's not. <laughs> he's still here. Job's still not completely done. The kingdom has not been consummated yet it's been inaugurated hasn't been consummated yet so yeah i might do that next time but not not in great detail but um this is why god is being very clear you don't you don't you don't intermarry with that you can't those gods are destructive they're they're (coughs) <coughs> they're demons. <coughs> and, um, all right, so let's look at verse 15 again. The first instruction, be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land, for when they prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifice to them, they will invite you and you will eat their sacrifices. And when you choose some of their daughters as wives for your sons, and those daughters prostitute themselves to their gods, they will lead your sons to do the same. Do not make cast idols. Celebrate the feast of unleavened bread. This is the first feast, by the way. We know this as this Passover. 
For seven days eat bread made without yeast, as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Abib. That's the first month. For in that month you came out of Egypt. The first offspring of every womb belongs to me, including all the firstborn males of your livestock, whether from herd or flock. Redeem the firstborn donkey with a lamb, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem all your firstborn sons. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall labor, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during the plowing season and harvest you must rest. Celebrate the Feast of Weeks. This is now Pentecost. With the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the, first, and the Feast of Ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times a year all your men are to appear before the Sovereign Lord, the God of Israel, I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your territory, and no one will covet your land when you go up there three times each year to appear before the Lord your God. Do not offer the blood of a sacrifice to me along with anything containing yeast, and do not let any of the sacrifice from the Passover feast remain until morning. Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God, do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk, which is one that just kind of stands out. But if you've ever gone to, uh, to Israel, they will not ser- serve cheeses and meats in the same, ser- in the same um, setting as, as, as a remembrance to this. I did not know that. Then the Lord said to Moses, write down these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, (coughs) his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with them, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. What an interesting um, back and forth. Um, Now, um, from this point on to the rest of this chapter, you get the completion, if you will, of the tabernacle. And then when you get to chapter 40, which let's go there now, you get the setting up of the tabernacle. And... Let's go to verse 33 of chapter 40. This concludes Exodus. Then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and altar and put up the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And all in all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day and fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the house of Israel during all their travels. Now, that concludes Exodus. We go into Leviticus. <coughs> Leviticus 
focuses, and the name itself focuses on the various sacrifices that were required with regards to the priestly ministry. I'm not going to go into them in great detail. I'm going to skim over them, if you will. Um, but we will go back and, um, and, and take a look at um, some of the sacrifices as we go forward. Suffice it to say that um, the sacrificial system was in play um, for many, m many different reasons. Um, but one of the more profound understandings is that the tabernacle itself was a template for spiritual reality. Now, I'm not sure how far I want to go with this. Sacrifice was the primary duty of the priests. Whether it was grain sacrifice, blood sacrifice, they were the ones that were to take whatever was the required sacrifice and offer it to the Lord. It was brought to the priest, but it was offered to the Lord by the priest. So the worshiper would bring the offering, but they didn't offer it. That's something that the priest and only the priest would do. And we covered this more extensively in terms of if we are priests, what do we offer? What is it that we offer? And we took some time to take a look at that. We offer ourselves, our body, our prayers, and intercessory prayers. And until we know how to do that, um, we can't function in that priestly manner. And the priestly prayer life um, I'm going to put it this way. The sacrificial offerings were prescribed. You didn't have to guess. You didn't have to guess. It was very simple, and this is what's covered in Leviticus. This is what you offer for this. This is what you offer for at this time of year. This is how you offer it, etc. Prayers and offering prayers are a completely different um, offering, if you will, because we don't know how to offer them. It's something that we learn how to do. What I'm discovering more and more is that the prayer life that I thought I knew isn't, isn't, um, It's not applicable to the current situation. I've got to learn a new way to pray. And so I'm asking God, I need to please teach me your ways. Because I don't know how to come against this. I don't know how to pray for this. I don't know how to come before you in prayer over this. You know, see, let me give you an example. Somebody comes to you and says, I'm sick. Will you pray for me? What do you pray for? Well, you don't know. Well, we've got to pray for healing. How do you know? Did you ask God what to pray for? It might be. But right now, in this moment, what you may be praying for is for stamina and strength to get through this. You don't know. And the priest must always get their instructions in terms of how we are to pray from God in that moment. We can't assume. And especially when you come from a tradition like ours, which for better, for worse, 
is a very formalized and prescribed form of worship. I mean, you ask Lutherans to pray, and unless it's printed out, we just can't do it. It's not that we can't, it's just we haven't been trained. And it's not just Lutherans, it's across the board. It's, prayer is something that is essential, that is the most important, but it is the most demanding in terms of complete surrendering of who you are. That's why it's a lot easier if somebody comes to you and says, this is what's going on, will you please pray for me, to say, I'll pray for you, and then just go on your way, and then maybe you will pray, maybe you won't, depending if you can remember. But to pray in that moment, to really carve out time to prayer, is a big sacrifice. And the, and the enemy will fight you tooth and nail to not do it. And he doesn't have to try that hard. <laughs> I just don't have time. I'm just not into it. Ah, uh, just too busy on a Tuesday. Whatever the case may be, whatever group, okay? But this is very important to, to, <coughs> to understand because as we're looking at this, Moses went into the tent of meeting before it was the tabernacle to seek God's will. Jesus' sacrifice allows us to go into the tabernacle to seek his will. But it is so foreign that <laughs> it's just, see, what we do here in a formalized, this we can wrap our mind around. Stand up. In fact, you don't even have to tell people anymore. Once you train them, they'll do it on their own, right? But to seek this, the leading of the Spirit, that is a... That is something that unless you know how to do, you can't go into the promised land. And, and what does that mean? It's not that Israel simply went into the promised land because God promised it to them. It's they were God's means of removing every single demonic deity and force and power that had settled into that area and taking control of that area and taking control of all of those people. That's what it is. And there's no way that humanity can fight against those forces from their own strength. It's, there's no way. It's an impossibility. We don't have it within us. Only God can defeat those spiritual dark forces that are set up against him and keep us in prison. Only God can do it. <clears throat> so this is very, this is the template that is, that is not just a template for the past, but a template for our current situation. All right, let's just take a look at Leviticus uh, chapter 10 for a second. <coughs> chapter 10 of Leviticus. <coughs> Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense. And they author, offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So, boy, Jean sounds like uh, she's got it worse than I do. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke of when he said, Among those who approach me, I will show myself holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. Aaron remained silent. 
Moses summoned Mishael and <clears throat> Elzaphon, sons of Aaron's uncle Uziel, and said to them, Come here, carry your cousins outside the camp, away from the front of the sanctuary. So they came and carried them, still in their tunics, outside the camp, as Moses ordered. <coughs> then Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Eleazar and Ethamar, Do not let your, your hair become unkempt, and do not tear your clothes, or you will die, and the Lord will be angry with the whole community. Put your relatives, but rather your relatives, all the house of Israel, may mourn for those the Lord has destroyed by fire. Do not leave the entrance to the tent of meeting, or you will die, because the Lord's anointing oil is on you. So they did, as Moses said. Then the Lord said to Aaron, You and your sons are not to drink wine or other fermented drink whenever you go into the tent of meeting, or you will die. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. You must distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean, and you must teach the Israelites all the decrees the Lord has given them through Moses. Now, that, that, this word holy, you are a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood, that you are set apart. This is not a moral, it carries with it moral implications to be sure, for sure. But it is not primarily a moral set of instructions or a moral imperative. It is a imperative of faithfulness to the one God. Now, as we're getting ready to go in to numbers. Yes, question. The what? We're, consecration? We're, we're, what uh, verse are you looking at? I don't know if I have that. Where, where's what? Mine says, this is mine, verse 6. Then Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Eleazar and Ethamar, Do not let your hair become unkempt, and do not tear your clothes, or you will die, and the Lord will be angry with the whole community. But your relatives, all the house of Israel, may mourn for the, those the Lord has destroyed by fire. I don't have that word in there. What what? Oh, oh, the word that that's the, how they translate that with fire. Okay, well there there's your answer. Thank you. I've never heard that word actually, myself. Hmm. Okay. Now, um, let's go. Uh, because Leviticus has a lot of the various, <coughs> um, okay, let's go to chapter 16. This is the Day of Atonement. Chapter 16 of Leviticus. I invite you to take a look at all those uh, previous regulations. Now, uh, let's see what we have for uh, chapter 16. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons, Aaron, the two sons of Aaron who died when they approached the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark, or else he will die because I appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. This is how Aaron is to enter the sanctuary area, with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to put on the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his body. He is to tie the linen sash around him and put on the linen turban. These are sacred garments, so he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering. <coughs> Aaron is to offer the bull 
for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. Then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Does anybody have anything other than scapegoat? Do you have a, uh, a footnote behind it? What does your footnote say? The word is Zazazel. Now, you've got w one of the goats for, F-O-R, for the Lord. Okay? The other is for That's the, that's the Hebrew word. It's translated. If you look up the Hebrew word, it's translated scapegoat. But look at what it says. For the scapegoat, he is to cast lots for the two goats. One lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Wait, he is the scapegoat. I'm going to break this down a bit. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the desert as a scapegoat. <coughs> Azazel is a name. Azazel is one of the rebellious Remember Genesis, remember Genesis chapter 6? The sons of God came into the sons of um, men and had children with them. Oh, good. Thank you. Azazel was the leader of that. Now, this is Jewish, Jewish tradition that is not biblical in terms of it's not added to the scripture as canonical, but is Jewish tradition understood and popular, if you will, contemporary during Jesus' ministry, which is why Peter refers to it, which is why Jude refers to it. The land that the Lord reclaimed was holy because it's his. Anything outside that land is under the domain of evil forces. And you can, whether you believe in anything, believe in that or not, you can experience that reality going into various neighborhoods. You can go into a certain neighborhood. This neighborhood is not safe. Why? Did somebody teach you that? No, I just know it's not safe. You feel it. So, the Day of Atonement, the Lord gets his sacrifice, but all of the sins of Israel are placed on the other goat and sent out into the wilderness to Azazel because this is what he deserves, sin and death. He doesn't get life. He doesn't deserve life. He's a murderer from the beginning. So this is very important to see. He's, they're not offering it to him. They're sending their sins away because that's what he deserves, sin. Not a not. not faithfulness, not anything good. This is very important to, to, to understand. Um, and it, 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 it comes into play. Genesis 3 is something that we're very familiar with in terms of the serpent 
seducing humanity into rebellion and then enslaving them to self. But they didn't stop there. Evil never stops until everything is destroyed. So you see that, and, and, and God alludes this in Genesis 4. Sin is crouching at your door. But it only wants you to be sinful on Mondays and Thursdays. No. It desires to own you. Addicts are not addicts on Mondays and Thursdays. So, evil, while we're more familiar with Genesis 3, did not stop with Genesis 3. And when you take a look at what the, what the enemy does is always present himself as God and then tries to steal and usurp whatever is God's. So if God is, glor- God is glory, he masquerades as an angel of light. God, the devil is beautiful. And I, first time I heard that was Ruth in our prayer group. And it, you know, we hate the devil, right? I mean, can we at least agree on that? Okay. But I, I had not heard vocally, you're right, he is absolutely gorgeous. Otherwise, nobody would follow him. Masquerades as an angel of light. Promising goodness. Promising kindness. Promising love and affection. And leaves you in squalor. So, um, yeah. So the Day of Atonement recognizes this is l- the, the Lord's territory. And as such, <coughs> the Day of Atonement incorporates this. I just wanted to point this out. There are a number of those. Um, beings that came in and they're judged by God. The second thing, and by the way, the Nephilim did not get extinguished because of the flood. They showed up after the flood. So the Nephilim are in the area. They were there before and after the flood. And that wasn't the only time. Then you got the Tower of Babel. And they're not just little little stories. Now, what, what's interesting is when you go through and what you find through with the various uh, nations that are around Israel archaeologically, many of them, if not all of them, have all of these stories that are in Scripture. And why not? Because the devil will always try to take the story and change history to be about him. So when you look at, say, the tablets of Ugarit that they're finding, they have the flood story. But the flood story is a completely different story than our flood story. Because they changed it. This is the very, uh, very important to understand. So does, so does uh, Mesopotamian culture as well. And so when God is going into this, this, this territory... He is reclaiming that, his, his people and his creation. And through Israel, the intention was a new Eden. You ruin the first Eden, I'll recreate it. All right. Um, any questions on that? 
you are going to see also that uh, I'm not going to get into it. Um, there's a lot of a lot of things in in Leviticus that are important, but I I I, I want to go over to Numbers now, and then we're gonna. <coughs> Oh. Also, the psalm they summarized it up. Okay. David. Yeah. It is. Um, it's remarkable. I love. I, I love. The psalms are very prophetic. Very prophetic. So now, we're going to get into numbers. Why is it called numbers? Because they're they're putting in order. Um, the nation of Israel. And they're putting it into a camp. Now, <coughs> excuse me. When you get to Numbers 3, let's say, um, you know, I don't know if I want to if I want to go there yet. Um, priestly blessing. Maybe maybe we should just go to thirteen. Um, no, let's go to let's go to let's go to ten. Numbers ten. Numbers chapter 10. I'm going to scroll down to verse 11. On the 20th day of the second month of the second year, the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle of the testimony. Then the Israelites set out from the desert of Sinai and traveled from place to place until the cloud came to rest in the desert of Paran. They set out the first time at the Lord's command through Moses. So they spent a little over a year at Mount Sinai. They spent a little over a year building the tabernacle, getting things ready for them to leave, and now they're leaving and in verse 14, the divisions of the camp of Judah went first, and then you get all the divisions. They went out in a very orderly way. They went out in a, in a way that was very militaristic in its formation. And the way they camped, the way they broke camp, the order of how they broke camp, the order of how they created camp was all laid out for them. It wasn't a, a mob. It was very, very organized. Then, and I just wanted to point that out in chapter 10. Then, um, you get to chapter 11. Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. <coughs> then fire from the Lord burned around them and consumed some on the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So the place was called Tabera, because fire from the Lord had burned among them. Then you get the quail, and so on and so forth. Then you get chapter 12, where Miriam and Aaron oppose Moses. Now, um, eh, maybe, we, maybe we should just... How much time do I have? 
let me just do one thing, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and review. We'll go back and review 12 next time, but go with me, please, to chapter 13. Now they're going to explore Canaan. So this is chapter 13 of Numbers, verse 31. No, 26. They explored the land. They did reconnaissance. And in verse 26, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert, desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there. (coughs) The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. You're kidding me. (laughs) We just saw this in Genesis 6. It gives a very poignant snapshot as to the danger. These people are not people. It's very hard for us to, to, to wrap our minds around evil because we're so sheltered from it. But evil, you get, we used to get some of that in, um, in, uh, in our science fiction now, that we're playing around with things we shouldn't play with, that we're going we're gonna to clone people because we can do that now. We can play God. We can take things and make superhumans and we can adjust this and we can and when you get to um in the in the movie Jurassic Park Jeff Goldberg's character I can't remember his name when the when everything has go, run amok he said we were so busy trying to f- answer the question could we do it nobody bothered to ask the question should we do it this goes back to the nephilim Okay, and um, when you take this seriously in terms of its revelation of the non-spiritual world, the rebellion that is involved there, when you take a look at every single one of the various pagan um, deities and so forth, they're all mixed breeds of animal and, and, and human and all that stuff. They all are. Half horse, half this, half that, half whatever. Where does that come from? That's not God. And see, as long as the enemy can put it in nice, very cute, non-threatening, mythological children's stories... The danger has been removed. But the beings behind that are still the same. Pink unicorns. unicorns. So, um, anyway. And all of them have sexual deviancy involved in them. Every single one of them. So... um, yeah, I, I think it would be important just to take a look at maybe next week what the various deities, how, what, what they were in charge of and what they promoted. Various deities, um, not going to get into too, you know, the thing about evil is it's important to be aware of, but you can't 
dwell with it. It's 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 um it'll 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 stain you. It'll uh yeah it it'll just um, corrupt. But with God, there's power over. So anyway, let's pick up next next week with chapter thirteen as we go into the promised land. Um, this is one of the things that scholars really have been struggling with for years. How can a God that's so loving just go in and, and do what he did in terms of taking various peoples and, well, and destroying them completely? And there is a theological reasoning behind that um, that will begin to make sense. But anyway, um, any questions before we come to a close? Yes. Yeah. Mo- names of what people, people, peoples. Everybody's name. Well, a lot of it has to do. A lot of the names have to do with <coughs> giving identity to um, to to their children for. Like like for example, Esau is Esau because he's got red hair. <laughs> They call him red, you know. Um, Jacob means the deceiver, so that's how he gets his name. Biblical names also, if, if, the, if the last name ends with L-E-L, which means the Lord, it has something to do with the Lord. Daniel, Ezekiel, etc. cetera. Um, we do the same thing. I mean, I did the same thing. I was exposed to the same thing growing up in Minnesota because we had a lot of Scandinavian people, and they just um, took the, the surname of their fathers and, declared that they were their sons, so you had the Andersons. You know, we all came from Andy. That's how that name came from, so nameology. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for, for your word. As we go into your word today, please open up our hearts and minds to be able to see and understand and be changed by your goodness. And this we pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Have a great rest of the day.